President Maduro welcomes renewed cooperation with Russia at the end of his visit to Moscow. The United Nations General Assembly meets for the second day. And Britain's Prime Minister clashes with the opposition leader as Parliament returns. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I'm Camila Escalante. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro has concluded a visit to Russia, where he and President Putin agreed on a strategic plan for cooperation. At their meeting in Kremlin, President Putin reaffirmed, reaffirmed Russia's commitment to carry on fulfilling the military technical agreements signed years ago with Venezuela. And he also assured President Maduro of Russia's support for the legitimate go Venezuelan government and its dialogue with the opposition. And of course, we are actively cooperating in the international arena. You know that Russia consistently supports all legitimate authorities, including the Institute of the Venezuelan President and that of the Parliament. And of course, we support the dialogue that you, Mr. President, your government is conducting with the opposition forces. We consider any refusal of dialogue to be irrational, harmful to the country, and bearing only threats to the welfare of the Venezuelan people. We always support legitimate authorities, and I think we have proved that we can jointly overcome any difficulties. We support established cooperation in all areas. Last May, a meeting of the high-level commission of our countries was held, and many of the issues discussed at this commission were successfully resolved. We are talking about a number of areas, food, health care, energy, and many other areas. Therefore, today's meeting is very important. We can take stock of what has been done this year in order to see what problems we still have, what realities we are facing, how progress is being made in a number of areas, and make plans for the future. We always feel very comfortable in Moscow and are always happy to be here. And President Maduro sent a video message from Red Square on Wednesday night. Here we are, three degrees in Red Square, where it is now 10.15 at night. From here we send our greetings to all the people of Venezuela and to our brothers and sisters in Latin America and around the world, reasserting our belief that another world is possible a world without empires, a world of fraternal relations. We have agreed with President Putin our strategic map of cooperation for the whole coming period, so that we can complete this year successfully and point towards 2020, 2021, 2022. I am leaving Moscow very pleased because we have consolidated the path set by, by Commander Hugo Chavez, a path that will bear many fruits. Thank you to Russia and thank you to President Putin. We will continue to overcome in the future. A U.S.-Iran showdown marked the second day of the United Nations General Assembly meeting, with both countries putting forward divergent views on Middle East security. But Iranian officials say that there is little to no chance that President Hassan Rouhani and his U.S. counterpart would meet on the sidelines of this event. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky delivered his first ever speech before the General Assembly, but made no mention of the impeachment inquiry which Trump faces over a phone call with him. On the margins of the UN General Assembly, US President Donald Trump met with the members of the Lima Group of Latin American countries to discuss their campaign against Venezuela. Venezuela's foreign minister gave Telesur his response to that meeting. It's, it's the puppeteer with the puppets, telling them what to do. Um, and of course, they are all really frustrated because they have tried all year long to overthrow our government. It has been a continuous coup. They have sanctioned and uh, they have imposed all this blockade against the Venezuelan people. And they haven't reached their goals. They haven't achieved their goals and they won't. So it's really Trump trying to distract the, the public opinion of his own scandals. And it's about his political campaign as well. His face, the face of Trump, 
He, it was, he was like disgusted. He didn't like to be there, you know? maybe because he doesn't like the Latin Americans. No? Su cara era de asco, no le gustaba estar en esa reunión. But, of course, he has to use Venezuela like Colombia uses Venezuela and other countries use Venezuela in order to distract the public opinion and not to concentrate in their own issues and their own problems. So that's, that's the real truth. And uh, we hope that someday the United States, the elite that rules in the United States, learns to respect not only the Venezuelan people, but all the Latin American peoples. And we can have a relation of mutual respect and political tolerance and ideological tolerance. We hope if President Trump or his government wants to have dialogue with the Venezuelan government, our hands are opened and we can have dialogue. If they respect us, we will respect them. Thank you so much. On Tuesday, Chavista lawmakers in Venezuela return, returned to the opposition-controlled National Assembly. It was part of the agreement signed last week with sectors of the opposition to unblock the political deadlock. Revolutionary lawmakers arrive at the National Assembly in Caracas to retake their seats. They withdrew two years ago when the auction majority defied the Supreme Court and decided to admit three of their candidates whose election had been marred by fraud. As a result, the court declared the assembly in breach of the Constitution. The session was a turning point. The Chavista members will try to help the assembly overcome its breach of the Constitution and recognize the other powers of state. This is part of the agreement signed last week with that part of the Venezuelan opposition which opposes military intervention, coups and economic sanctions. All things that the parties backing the self-proclaimed president, Juan Guaido, have supported. We are making this political gesture to open up debate, to open up the way for dialogue and constitutional solutions for understanding, so that the different powers of the republic can resume their proper roles. That is why we are here. The aim is to break the political deadlock and restore the political institutions, according to the opposition members who signed the agreement. This reincorporation certainly gives the assembly an opportunity for dialogue for debate between the different ideas. Each side can strongly defend its positions, but then we can take decisions for the good of Venezuela. One of these decisions has to do with achieving the necessary quorum to elect new members of the National Electoral Council. Time is against them. Elections to the Assembly are due next year. However, the extremist opposition insists that President Nicolas Maduro should step down. And there should be a presidential election, which is not in line with the Constitution. We will work to make this body work and work well, to overcome this body's breach of the Constitution and to prepare for the parliamentary elections in 2020, when we will go out and campaign for the votes of our people. But the opposition objected to the presence of Chavista lawmakers who accepted other government posts while they were away from the National Assembly. If someone accepted another government post, they lost their seat. Although it's true that the Constitution says you lose your seat if you accept another public position, it is this assembly that decides on its members, and this assembly is in breach. And the ruling on that breach says that all its decisions are illegal. The Constitution is clear that the final decisions on such matters rest with the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court. You are wrong. And those who took other posts are no longer members. That's final. This assembly is in conflict with the other powers of state. And I ask the people of Venezuela who are accountable to, how can the country move forward when those who are meant to solve problems cannot agree to sit down and work within the framework which applies to everyone, which is the Constitution? It will be the constitutional chamber that has to solve this dispute. We are not going to get stuck in this debate. All of us here were elected by the Venezuelan people, and as elected lawmakers, there is nothing to negotiate. The cards are now on the table, and Juan Guaido's term as president of the assembly is also running out. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute.
Welcome back. In Jamaica, heavy rainfall has resulted in landslides and flooding across roadways in the capital, Kingston, and in several other areas. There are also reports of water shortages in some affected communities. Cleanup activities are, however, currently underway. Flood impacted roadways and blocked drains are being cleared in a number of parishes. Work is also taking place in the St. Thomas area, where the road is blocked by a massive landslide. The persistent rains have also delayed activities on key road projects island-wide. Following increased geological activity over the weekend, citizens and foreigners are warned against visiting the mud volcano in Pipero, Trinidad and Tobago. The volcano is located in a central village in Trinidad. Residents have reported cracks on the roadway with damage caused to at least one house. The Ministry of National Security says it's working with key stakeholders to monitor the situation while the police service has held a meeting in the village to roll out an evacuation plan with safety guidelines. The area has been cordoned off to prevent entry. Electoral observers and experts are beginning to arrive in Bolivia to accompany the elections set to take place on October 20th. First European Union Electoral Observation Mission has arrived. The mission will continue until the conclusion of the electoral process, and during its time here, specific reports will be made that will certainly be made public as they are completed. The European Union mission plans to carry out one of the most thorough studies of the whole Bolivian electoral process, which includes an exhaustive survey of the opinion of different sectors. We have begun an intense program, which will include meetings with the main authorities, political leaders and civil society representatives. So in the coming days, this long-term mission will follow the whole Bolivian electoral process very closely. Meanwhile, the political opposition is trying to discredit the election process. They have already attempted, without success, to mobilize citizens to push Evo Morales to abandon his candidacy for re-election and to get members of the electoral court to resign. Beyond the current elections, I think they are going to try to undermine the process and take a position like that of the civic committees and claim to be defending democracy, whatever people decide at the polls. With less than one month before people go to vote, the opposition is spreading doubts about the election and insisting that there will be fraud, fears which could be countered by these international observers. Bolivia has a system which is based on electoral boards, and observers from each party are able to see all the voting records as soon as the polls close, so that they can check the validity of the results. This is what the international observers have to oversee, and that's why they are here. This will be the first election in which the electoral register is audited by the Organization of American States. One of the demands of the opposition, the latest opinion polls indicate that Evo Morales will take first place and be re-elected in the first round if he maintains his current lead of more than 10 points over the former president, Carlos Mesa, who is in second place. In Algeria, the brother of former president Abdel Aziz Bouteflika has been sentenced to 15 years in prison for conspiring against the state and undermining the military. Said Bouteflika and two other officials allegedly plan to declare a state of emergency and fire the army chief as protests against the president were mounting in April. Said was widely seen as the real power behind the presidency after his older brother suffered a stroke in 2013. President Abdelaziz Bouteflika was ousted from power in April following protests calling for his resignation. The Nigerian army has closed four offices of international aid group Mercy Corps in the northeastern region of the country. Later, Mercy Corps announced it's suspending its operations in the states of Borni and Yub, Yob due to the army's action. The military reportedly closed the offices after finding almost $10,000 in cash being transported in Borno state by a driver who said the money belonged to Mercy Corps. Northeast Nigeria has been the region worst hit by militant group Boko Haram, which has, been, which has killed 30,000 people and forced 2 million to flee their homes over the last decade. 
South Africa is still grappling with the ripples of colonialism and apartheid. The apartheid government sponsored traditional leadership to keep the black population within the confines of homelands. But 25 years into democracy, there are questions being raised on traditional leadership in a democratic South Africa. Before 1994, black South Africans were forced by the white supremacist government laws to live with people of the same skin color, language and ethnicity. The apartheid government gave legitimacy to homelands for black people and gave each one a leader that would make sure black people did not mix with whites. Fast forward to 2019, the question asked is, what is the point of government funding traditional leaders in a democracy? It sounds a bit cynical from my side, but I think government over for many years, and all the main parties, not only the ANC, the IFP and Carter Freedom Party is another good example of that, they know the cultural importance and traditional importance of traditional leaders, and that in many societies, they are the key to those persons, whether it is about how they are going to vote, um, what they are doing in all respects, whether they support government or not, so if you can have the sympathy, the cooperation of the traditional leaders on your side, you are safe. The role of traditional leaders remains ambiguous. While government recognizes the authority, they don't have any executive power. So they are not involved, as they are not part of parliament or they are not part of the executive. Um, but we are also not always sure exactly what are the status of their polls. There's now, for example, legislation in the pipeline about um, the traditional courts you know, um, versus obviously the, 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 the more secular, the more m modernist courts, if we can call that. And this is, in a sense, uncertainty about how these different types of courts are going to work side by side. Another issue that sparked debate is the government's funding of traditional leaders and their families. South Africa's largest tribe, the Zulu Nation, have a king that gets the biggest cut of funding for traditional leaders. Opposition parties questioned why King Goodwill Zolitini gets an equivalent of $5 million per year. At the same time, government is yet to resolve grievance by the Aboriginal people of South Africa. South Africa has one of the most progressive constitutions in the world. While it seeks to protect the marginalized, will it protect traditional leaders who are associated with creating a patriarchal society? Matuba Masachi for Telesur in Pretoria, South Africa. We'll take a break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back. Washington has released the much anticipated transcript of US President Donald Trump's phone call with Ukraine President Volodymyr Volensky. The five page summary shows that Trump offered to help the US Attorney General investigate former Vice President and 2020 presidential candidate Joe Biden. In a July 25th phone call Trump made to his e Ukrainian counterpart, He's said to have pressured Zelensky to investigate whether Biden shut down a probe into an energy company where his son worked. According to the transcript, Trump said in the call, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. That phone call has in turn ignited impeachment proceedings against the US president. The United States has imposed sanctions on Chinese companies for allegedly buying Iranian oil. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said sanctions are being placed on state-owned Costco shipping and other Chinese shippers and also on their chief executives. This comes as France tried to arrange a meeting at the United Nations between Donald Trump and his Iranian counterpart Hassan Rouhani to de-escalate tensions. In an explosive clash in the Commons, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson challenged MPs to table a no-confidence vote against his government. 
Johnson was speaking to lawmakers a day after the Supreme Court ruled his suspension of Parliament unlawful. In a heated exchange with opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn, Johnson said the Supreme Court judges were wrong, as Corbyn told him to first get a Brexit extension to secure an election. The clashes came after Attorney General Jeffrey Cox said he would consider publishing the legal advice which led to the unlawful shutdown of Parliament. Johnson accused MPs of political cowardice and demanded Parliament step aside to allow, to allow him to deliver Brexit. He attacked Corbyn for claiming to want a general election, but voting against it. So if in fact the party opposite does not have confidence in the government, they will have a chance to prove it. They have until the House rises. Let them li listen, 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 listen. I think they should listen to this, Mr. Speaker. They have until the House rises today to table a motion of no confidence in the government. Come on! Come on! Come on then! And we can have that vote tomorrow. Will they have the courage to act or will they refuse to take responsibility and do nothing but dither and delay? Why wouldn't they? What are they scared of, Mr Speaker? The judges concluded there was no reason, and I quote, let alone a good reason for the Prime Minister to have shut down Parliament. After yesterday's ruling, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister should have done the honourable thing and resigned. And there's more. Johnson triggered further fury in the Parliament and beyond the chambers when he said the best way to honor the memory of the late Prime Minister Joe, or sorry, the late uh, MP Joe Cox is to deliver Brexit. Cox, a Labour MP, was shot and stabbed in June 2016 in the run-up to the Brexit referendum. The husband of the murdered MP took to Twitter to condemn the Prime Minister's remarks. The death toll from a devastating earthquake that rattled Pakistan, administered Kashmir, and several northeastern cities rose to 37 on Wednesday. Authorities have stepped up rescue operations to save people trapped in the debris of several fallen buildings. A hospital in Mirpur was filled with activity as more than 200 injured people were rushed in for treatment. Science and knowledge are among the main resources used by the Syrian people to overcome the economic war being waged on the country. University students are at the forefront of these efforts to overcome the difficulties facing everyday citizens. This is the second expo of graduation projects for final year students specializing in mechanical and electrical engineering at the University of Damascus. Here, ideas for reconstruction of their homeland thrive. We are here to tell the entire world that is this unjust blockade that is making us go through very rough circumstances. But they haven't been able to block our minds, and we continue looking for ways to move forward with our development. Our students' contributions are very important for the reconstruction of Syria. That's why we organized this expo, to showcase their best ideas and then help them through state and private institutions to develop their projects into useful products for society. Engineering students refuse to do nothing under such difficult circumstances. Their ideas are a great help to reconstruction efforts, especially in the worst hit areas after nine years of war. My sister was hit by the shrapnel in her spine, and due to the economic blockade, I was unable to buy the prosthesis she needed. After that, I designed a similar prosthesis that can be manufactured here and be sold at an accessible price. Our power grid has been greatly damaged due to the war, so as renewable energy engineers we have given ourselves the task of finding alternative power sources. From there we came up with a number of ideas to provide low-cost energy for street lamps. This expo is showcasing 80 projects that want to help society and promote productive development. It stands as a space where Syrians can make their best efforts to help in the reconstruction of their homeland. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tellsourenglish.net. 
and join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Our English, I'm Camila Escalante. Thanks for watching.